Christie, what, a couple of weeks ago? Uh, in a couple of weeks. I mean, I, 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 def I defended, I defended in January, and uh, I don't have the diploma in hand. Yeah. So but uh, these are in. everything is done. All but degreed uh, PhD student who's going to get it. Uh, his dissertation is finished, and we have actually have downloaded a copy of it. And he's here to uh, speak on his dissertation work, which is uh, chaining layer integrity checks, um, a fancy way, as he is telling, of uh, uh, secure boot. So. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> um, thanks, Cynthia, very much. Uh, my name is Bill Arbaugh, and uh, I'm from the Department of Defense. And today, I'm going to describe to you uh, work that I did at the University of Pennsylvania, and also at the Department of Defense. Uh, and as, as usual, uh, as government employees need to do, I need to state. You know, start off by saying that the, the views expressed by myself today are uh, not necessarily those of my employer or the Department of Defense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, having said the lawyers, kept the lawyers happy, I'll go ahead and move on as soon as the laptop wakes up. There we go. Um, I want to start off just real quickly with uh, what I consider to be trust. Uh, if, you, if you look across the literature over the last 20 or so years, uh, you're going to find many definitions for trust. And the definitions that I want to use are basically variations of what Peter Neumann and SRI has, has defined. And the first is that an object is trusted when it operates as you expect it to. All right, and that, that your expectations are from either a design or a policy. And a trustworthy object is one in which you've demonstrated in a convincing manner that it's going to operate as a trusted object. Now, wh what's a convincing manner? I mean, the term is, is intentionally vague. Uh, a convincing manner can be a formal proof. Um, unfortunately, formal proofs in a real world scenario are, are, are very difficult to do. And so most of the time, uh, the convincing manner is a code review, um, black box testing, uh, you know, a, a thorough testing process, and, and also a very structured design process. So, having set kind of some definitions to make sure we're all on the same uh, page, I want to define for you the problem that I'm going to address today. And, and basically, the problem is that some of the assumptions that were made in secure systems 20 years ago uh, have become invalid. In particular, uh, 20 years ago when people were looking at secure system design, uh, the immutability of the hardware layer was a given. And so it was assumed that the hardware would remain constant. Um, that, uh, with the advent of flash ROMs today, is not necessarily the case. And, and, and you, as you look across the different hardware devices nowadays, everything is just about, everything is pretty much programmable. So, you know, as a result of the invalidation of that assumption, what you have now is a hardware layer that, as soon as I find the right button, can actually change underneath the, the operating system without the operating system ever knowing it. And the, the CIH virus or Chernobyl uh, is, is a classic example of that, uh, where you have an applications program reprogramming the underlying firmware. Uh, So, let's take a step back and, and, and look at what's been done in the past in regards to a, a secure bootstrap. Uh, most of the efforts uh, focused on engineering, and they didn't really try and take a step back or take a higher step up and say, can we develop a formal foundation for the engineering work that we're doing? Uh, and also, none of, the, none of the previous efforts resulted in uh, a practical implementation. Uh, there are always assumptions that were made that were fairly significant and, and couldn't result in an actual uh, working device. So th this is a collection of, of the previous work. Uh, Rat Bag was a Department of Defense effort uh, about, uh, I guess my dates are pretty bad here, probably about seven to ten years ago. 
uh, that actually was the precursor for this work. Um, uh, Berlix was, was done by a group in Germany uh, and it, it was very similar to Lampson who basically just wrote a couple paragraphs about uh, secure boot in an authenticated calculus paper. Uh, you, you had um, Bennett Yee at, at Carnegie Mellon uh, who did a partial implementation of a secure boot. Um, a uh, guy down at uh, GW uh, by the name of uh, Clark did uh, a, a BITS implementation uh, that uh, was implemented but it used the PCMCIA card and um, it actually relied on the BIOS being valid and so the BIOS could, if it were programmed properly, skip around the, the, the PCMCIA or the smart card altogether. Uh, and then actually, interestingly enough, there were a couple of patents uh, out there in, in the patent database uh, that were never discussed in any of the academic uh, literature. Uh, and you know, as a result, I don't know if they were implemented, uh, but uh, there were actually two patents, one by IBM and one by Compaq, and uh, they both had some, some problems in their implementation, actually. So it's kind of a summary of the, of the engineering and, and, the, and the work. In, in the area of, of the uh, formal reasoning behind the engineering work, uh, we're really looking at the area of composing systems. Um, and really, uh, we're composing blo high integrity blocks together. And Parnas was the only one that, that we were able to find that, that had done any work in this area. And this is about 20 years old. And he had defined uh, what, what is called a uses relation that was kind of part of structured, the big structured programming uh, uh, effort back then and actually it was, it's very nice um, it, from a security standpoint uh, and I actually use Parnas' uh, uses um, relation as a basis for my work by adding some, some requirements on the transition uh, rather than just transi um, transitioning to a new layer without checking anything. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about what, what I did as part of this work. And, and the first, first uh, novelty of the work is that uh, we developed a, a intuitive method for composing s layered systems into a high integrity. Basically, give you, we, we give you a model that you can compose layers into a high integrity object. Um, and then as an instantiation of that model, uh, I developed Aegis, which is a secure boot process for the IBM PC. In, in every research effort, it's always important to describe what you're not going to cover. Uh, and in, in this effort, I stay away from trust management uh, because that's a can of worms uh, for many uh, research efforts. And I also stay away from the verification and validation of programs as trustworthy. Uh, that, that's a very difficult area, but there's also some very interesting work uh, being done in it by Peter Nekula with proof-carrying proof code and some others. Um, and so these are the two areas that I, that I uh, avoid uh, as part of this work. So going to kind of giving a background of the theory behind all of this, uh, we really focus on layering. You know, there's the old joke in computer science that you know, there's no problem in computer science that can't be solved by adding another layer. Uh, it, and to some degree, it's actually accurate. Uh, and, and layers are very good. Uh, it, it eases the design process. And usually, the added cost of introducing a layer is, is deemed worthwhile. Uh, so what I started to do is look and say, OK, is there a way that we can combine these layers in a way such that their integrity can remain valid? Uh, between transition between layers. So I need to define what a layer is in respect to this work. A layer is going to have the following properties. It's going to have static integrity. All right? Now static integrity means it doesn't change from some previous time. And that's a property that we can actually uh, ensure through this model. A layer needs to have dynamic integrity. And actually, I need to have assume next to that rather than, uh, than having to be blank there. Uh, by dynamic integrity, I mean that when the layer is actually in execution, it's actually in core, it doesn't change. 
So self-modifying code violates the dynamic integrity property. And then finally, we have to assume that it's trustworthy. And, and I probably, uh, in the slide here, just had assume next to that because assuming that an object is trustworthy more implies the dynamic integrity property in my opinion. Some may argue that, uh, but I, I personally believe that self-modifying code while an interesting exercise is, is uh, dangerous from a security standpoint. So what do you do then when you compose layers uh, with, with the click model? Well, you, you, you have to have a, a base layer. Now, when, when you're looking at this, think induction right away because basically what click is is a simple application of induction where you have a base layer that's going to be stored in some kind of immutable storage. Uh, that immutable storage can be a ROM or it can be a flash ROM in a boot block of a flash ROM that you can protect uh, by leaving one of the pins low. And then as the system is, is starting up, before you transition from, from one layer to, an, to the next layer, you have uh, that layer protected by crypto. And that layer can be protected by simple hashes, depending on the system. Or in, in the case of Aegis, which I'll describe in a little bit, we actually use public key crypto. So what happens here is before I actually pass execution control to the next layer, I validate the digital signature over that layer. If it's valid, I pass control to it. If it's not valid, well, then I have to stop and sit back and say, OK, you know, th this is where we get into the policy issue. Do I halt the system, which is very simplistic, but introduces a denial of service attack? Or do I try and enter a recovery process? And in the, in the Aegis architecture, we actually enter into a recovery process to give us a degree of fault tolerance. So I actually got ahead of myself a little bit here, but basically the transition validation function, uh, which is that function that protects the layer transition, uh, I used RSA and MD5. Um, and then for, for each layer, I had a, a SUDSE, uh, SUDSE public key certificate. Uh, and basically a SUDSE public key certificate is a, a poor man's X509. Uh, there's probably several people who hear that will probably want to get very upset with me is an oversimplification of it. But basically, it's a very simple public key certificate. And it doesn't carry all of the burden that you have with X509, which is Burr and all these other encoding things, uh, which really, um, the difference between implementing Sudsy in, in embedded code and uh, X509 is about 30K, uh, 30 kilobytes. And when you're starting with 128K ROM that you had to play with, uh, where 112K of it's already used, um, 30K, even if you compress it down, you can get a compression ratio of about 2 to 1. Um, uh, you still don't have enough room for it. So, From a practical standpoint, X509 is much better because that's what everybody's using. Um, but from a, a, the, when the real world meets, it, it just didn't work out. So I'm going to right now kind of step you through what happens with Aegis, which is the how an IBM PC starts and how I overlaid the click model to, to get Aegis. So at the lowest layer, or level zero, now this is, this is going to be code that, that is going to be stored in an immutable storage. Uh, you have a, a BIOS, what I call BIOS level one. Uh, BIOS level one is basically only that part of the BIOS that is responsible for testing and setting up the hardware devices on the motherboard. Um, and then also I had a NIC ROM. And the NIC ROM is where I had my recovery code and, and the device certificates for uh, the recovery. I also mentioned in the BIOS 1 is also where I store the, the root public key. Uh, so that's where the, the root public key for the, the, the public key hierarchy is kept. BIOS 1 moves up to BIOS 2. BIOS 2 is where you're starting to set up the interrupt vectors and the like, um, and starting to add some more functionality that the operating systems need on top of the BIOS. Uh, as part of the BIOS 2, what it does, it goes out and does an expansion ROM scan. Uh, and what the expansion ROMs are, uh, if you have a video card, you have an expansion ROM. Uh, and basically what this is is additional firmware that, that comes in and 
uh, basically uh, inserts itself into the different interrupts uh, for the BIOS as part of the boot process. You could potentially also have an expansion ROM that, that's a boot ROM that actually then takes control and, and tries to do a network boot. Um, once the expansion ROM scan is done, uh, the BIOS 2 goes out and, and tries to find the boot sector from the bootable device. Uh, the boot sector being the first 512 bytes uh, in a well-defined location. Uh, that then goes out and, and uh, loads the OS. Now you could have multiple boot sectors here. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, FreeBSD or PicoBSD, which is what I worked with, has a primary and a secondary loader. The secondary loader is limited to about 8K, if I remember right. Uh, and that then would load up the OS. And then you're done. Or, or you can have user programs, actually. And actually, this work started from uh, an effort that I had worked on where we actually modified the uh, SunOS kernel to validate the integrity of executables before you executed them. Um, and after I had done that work, I kind of sat back and said, OK, how am I going to beat that? And well, you're going to beat that by changing the kernel. And I'm doing the, the additions that I had done. Then I said, well, how do you beat modifying the kernel? And you know, basically, we just did an inverse click all the way down into the, into the immutable storage. Uh, and, and then we come right back up. So that's kind of the genesis for all of this work. As I said earlier, you know, when you actually try to do one of these transitions and you find a problem, you know, there's a couple of different things you can do. The, the easiest being stop. The problem with that is, is that it introduces a denial of service attack. The other thing you could do is you could throw a little splash screen up to the user saying, hey, we found a bad component. What do you want to do, continue or stop? Well, 99% of the users are going to say, I want to continue. And so instead, what I decided to do was, well, let's see if we could actually build a recovery process into this. And what happens during the recovery process is, is we, uh, I designed a, a secure protocol with uh, Angelos Karamidis uh, at the University of Pennsylvania uh, that leverages DHCP and, and FTP uh, to go out to a trusted repository, uh, negotiate a, a key, and then transfer down a, a, a new component. So the client says, hey, I've got a bad BIOS too. Uh, and it would tell the trusted repository that. The trusted repository would say, OK, here's, an, here's a new one, and here's a good, new good certificate. And the, the client then would then reflash that and restart itself and, and start the process all over again. Uh, the interesting thing about this is, is that it actually has implications beyond just the, the secure process. It actually has implications for uh, remote management of the boot process uh, to where you can actually download new boot, boot blocks and, and you know, potentially even new uh, operating systems all remotely without the user knowing it. Uh, so uh, actually it turned out to be pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, the, we, we did the work uh, not, not looking at the remote management issues. And when we discussed it with a lot of people in the commercial sector, uh, they weren't all that interested in the security aspects of the work, but they were very interested in the remote management aspects of the work. Um, so talk a little bit about what the experimental setup was that I was working with. Uh, I used the Microid Research MR BIOS BIOS source code. Uh, and the, I worked primarily on an ASUS Pentium board. Uh, it used the Intel um, 430HX chipset, PCI chipset. Uh, and that, that motherboard had 128 KB flash RAM on it. Uh, and for the NIC card, I used an Intel EE Pro 100. Um, and then, of course, the, the PCI video card, uh, obviously. And I used the, the Pico BSD kernel as the operating system. In the actual instantiation of Aegis, um, we booted a Pico BSD kernel from the floppy uh, because the, this work was, was being designed to be a, a, a very secure network node uh, for active networks, which I'll describe in just a little bit. So some of the results, you know, what, what does it cost to add security to the, to the bootstrap process? Um, well, if you, if you look at the clock and you actually time a, a boot uh, up to the Pico BSD kernel when you, when you get the login prompt, uh, it's 84 seconds uh, with Aegis. Uh, 
doing the security work. And if you didn't have all that security there, it was 70 seconds. So it's about a 20% increase in cost. Um, not as good as I would have liked, uh, but still not terribly bad. It's not like we doubled it or something like that. Uh, people are, are fortunately used to waiting a long time for their PCs to start. Um, although the industry does have a number of initiatives now to try and increase that speed. And, and they increase that speed by taking a bunch of shortcuts during the, the bootstrap. Uh, breaking that cost out a little bit, if you can go back just and visualize that, that diagram that I showed you earlier, the validating the first two layers takes about four and a half seconds. And the primary reason for that is the cost of actually reading the image from the ROM. Uh, you know, actually going to it, I actually do, don't verify it in memory. I actually verify the image in ROM. And, and so you're paying a cost and a delay to go to ROM instead of RAM. And that's the primary overhead there. And you'll see why. You'll see, you'll see the difference in the overhead in a second. And the same thing for the PCI video uh, is, you know, 1.6 seconds. It's primarily because you're reading from the ROM. Uh, when, I, when I verify the, the two different loaders, uh, at this point, because the loaders actually have control of, of the system and there isn't enough room in the loaders to actually explode out um, my verification code, at this point my code is resident in RAM, which unfortunately is a bit of a vulnerability, but there's not much I could do about it. Um, and you can see the cost here is, is very, very small. Uh, and and the, the cost here is because I'm not paying the setup cost of moving my code out from the ROM, which is in a compressed state, up into RAM. Uh, and then finally, so the, the cost you have here basically is just, just the cryptographic functions. Uh, and then finally verifying the, the operating system kernel. Uh, it's about two seconds and the primary reason for that is the latency in, in doing the MD5 over such a large, large, large image and also pulling it off of the floppy disk. So I, I alluded to what the setup cost is. Um, just about everything in, in a modern BIOS now is compressed. And the reason for that is because of storage space. Uh, you know, 128K ROM, you can fit about 256K of executable code. I had, um, I guess it was around 16 to 20K to work with with this code. Uh, and so my code had to be compressed in there. And so because of the fact it's compressed, you can't execute from ROM. And so what I had to do is explode it up into RAM and, and decompress it and then execute it. And that's the, the setup cost that I'm talking about here. And, and the average cost for each setup is about one and a half seconds. So switching to, to the recovery uh, protocol, and it's uh, work that I did with Angelos Karamidis at Penn. Um, what we did is we augmented the DHCP protocol to basically overlay a, a variation of the station to station protocol. Uh, with the addition of nonces so that you prevent replay attacks and the like. Um, and we use DSA and SHA-1 for this. And because now I have a NIC ROM that I can throw this code on, uh, I can actually use X509 certificates. Uh, and so I actually used X509 certificates in, 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 this, in this part of the recovery process. The, the experimental setup for this, um, I used a 266 megahertz Pentium, the ASUS, uh, the Intel card again, and the machine had 64 megabyte of RAM. Uh, the server was a 300 megahertz Pentium 2 uh, with 64 mega RAM, and I used Ted Lemon's uh, DHCP server as the basis for my modifications to DHCP. So there are basically uh, four, four legs to a DHCP uh, connection. You have a discover message which is sent out initially. It's a broadcast message to the, to the entire LAN saying, hey, you know, I'm trying to boot. Please give me, you know, who can I talk to? Who's the server? Um, and the cost of doing that is, is roughly 153 milliseconds. Um, the server then responds back with a, hey, I'm your server. Uh, and actually, you can have multiple servers reply. And it's up to the client to choose one. Uh, and the cost of that is 221 milliseconds. And the reason why it's a little bit more expensive is because of um, the uh, verification of, the, of the, uh, the discover message when it comes in. 
Uh, the request message uh, came in at 40 milliseconds. And to be honest with you, I, had, I, I never really could get a good, good handle on why it was so much faster. Um, and then finally, an act message, which is 126 milliseconds. So the overhead of adding security to DHCP, public key se security, and actually during this process, we're exchanging, uh, we're using Diffie-Hellman to exchange a shared secret um, for basically doing MAC uh, codes over each packet as it's being FTP. So, you know, the overhead here is, is roughly a half a second uh, for the exchange of a shared secret. I mean, that's not all that significant. Although, the people that, that support large DHCP servers feel it's very unreasonable. Uh, but I, I'll get into that in a little bit. So just, just to finish up this, this, you know, kind of describing what we've done, what I've done, um, you know, we developed this uh, intuitive model that I call Click for composing layers into a high integrity system. And as an instantiation of that, I built Aegis, which is a secure bootstrap uh, process for the IBM PC. Um, and I want to talk about, the, you know, now that you, now that I've demonstrated the practicality of a secure boot process, we want to try and describe a little bit what the potential applications or what's the implication of having this kind of foundation. So, uh, one one thing that, that we were I've been working on actually still working on is uh, authenticated DHCP. Uh, with the IETF. Um, I'm hoping, uh, actually I think I'm, I'm getting uh, ahead of one of my slides here, but the, the, other, the other area that this is being actively used in is in the active network research community. Uh, active networking is this concept that uh, your packets actually can program a switch. So instead of having a, a static protocol at every node via the router that you currently have, that the packets as they come into the, the network switch can reprogram that switch to support new protocols, uh, new concepts in routing, or new services. Um, the problem that you have with any time you accept mobile code is the security implications of that. And there's been a great deal of effort on verifying the code that comes into the machine, as in, are the packets safe for the node? Uh, there hasn't been that much work on determining, is the node safe for the packets? And, and this is really what this addresses, is, is the node safe for the packets? Can the packets be assured they're going to be operating in a, in a reasonable manner, in a reasonable place? And, you know, in, in standard networking, that may not seem all that important, but if you start thinking about electronic commerce, where you're charging for the different interfaces that a switch is supporting, uh, it kind of becomes important. Uh, you know, if, if the switch can manipulate the packets and maybe decrement more money from your packet than you want. And, and the final is a, um, an idea that we had about a year or so ago uh, called secure identity-based loading. And the idea here is that you want to multiplex uh, a machine uh, to have different personalities. And, and the, the focal point was uh, an executive working from home uh, may want to have different personalities on his computer. He, he may want to co connect up to the corporate internet, which has one security policy. And at the same token, you may want to come up, connect up to the internet, which has you know, a very different security policy. And how do you allow those two to interact without having the home PC serving as a vector from the internet into the corporate intranet? Uh, so authenticated DHCP. Uh, we originally proposed, I originally proposed the, the protocol that we designed uh, as part of our recovery process as a authenticated DHCP for, for the IETF. Uh, the, we, met, we had a meeting uh, about a year ago at Microsoft, about 15 of us that are working on uh, authenticated DHCP. And as in any committee, um, the end result has morphed into something else. Um, fortunately, I'm still one of the editors for the draft. And we're actually hoping the draft is going to go final here at the next meeting in July in Oslo. Um, so, that, you know, assuming that nobody brings up any new objections, which can always happen. Uh, SANE, which is the active networking support. Um, this is kind of just a, a quick diagram of, of how an Aegis protected node differs from a non-Aegis protected node. And the red indicates that, you know, people are assuming the integrity of that equipment. And 
The green indicates that, well, we're verifying that integrity. And in active networking right now, all the packets, for the most part, when they come into the node are being verified. But as I said earlier, you know, like I said, there's been a lot of work on the node accepting safe packets, but not very little work being done on is the node safe for packets. And, and that's really where Aegis starts and SANE starts to kick in. And we kind of provide verification of the firmware, the OS, and the evaluation environment, which is what's accepting the packets as it comes in off the wire. Uh, this is a picture of what we kind of dreamed Sybil up to be, where you had a kernel and applications that were in this uh, immutable storage area. Uh, and then each role or each personality had a different partition of the disk that was encrypted. And based on the identity and the smart card that you stuck in during the bootstrap, the machine would decrypt and start using whichever role it was the smart card had indicated. Uh, and then, you know, if you were in a corporate role, you may very well want to use a virtual private network to connect up to the, you know, over the internet into your corporate intranet. Uh, whereas if it, you're in your private role, uh, your, your child using the machine to surf the internet or even yourself using the machine to surf the internet, you, you, you wouldn't have that, that secure layer layered in there and you do go straight off to the internet. Um, so basically it was just an idea, a notion of how you could multiplex a single machine into using different security policies. Uh, as for the future, where, where do we want to go with this? Uh, you know, the, the big problem right now, I mean, I believe Aegis has solved the static integrity problem. And there's a problem in, with integrity that remains, and that's what I call a dynamic integrity problem, and that's where you have programs under execution. How can you be assured that their images haven't changed in core? And that's a very, very difficult problem and uh, one that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, a lot of people have this view of the future uh, of Sagan S numbers of processors everywhere, billions and billions of processors that are all going to be intercommunicating. Uh, they'll all probably be accepting updates from, you know, either some kind of uh, server or possibly from other processors of their own peer level. Uh, and you're getting into a little bit of active networks at that point, and you really need to have some security thought about uh, in that whole design process. Uh, and then finally, you know, are there things that you can do at the hardware level that would uh, make Aegis more secure, give it, be able to allow you to give it a higher level of assurance, and instead of having the, the code in ROM exploded up into RAM, for instance, you know, hardware, a crypto hardware pr uh, processor, that type of thing. All those things are, are interesting future work. And I don't have my question slides, so that's it. And uh, if you see any questions, I'd uh, be happy to answer them. Paul. The uh, remote administration you mentioned mm -hmm. was, was there anyone actually interested in, in including that in some way in the Yeah. The, um, without mentioning the, the corporate name since we're on tape, uh, <laughs> the, there was one company, uh, we uh, had an agreement established with them. Uh, they were bought out by another company uh, and the other company had a product line similar and basically got rid of the first company's product line um, in lieu of their, their one that they had, uh, even though uh, I personally feel the, the other company had a much better product line. But, uh, um, Yes. What was the scheme for, for the remote site to indicate that a, that a layer needed to be replaced? Um, you mean to the, to the trusted repository? Yeah. Um, basically the DHCP discover message. Um, you can have, I defined a, an option as part of that and an option allows you to have content within that. And so I would in the discover message say, hey, uh, this particular, I had, you know, ID numbers associated for each layer. This, this layer this type of device. I actually had device certificates. Um, so I would say this device certificate is invalid, uh, you know, and please send me another one. No, but, but I was talking, you were talking about using this for, for a secure update right. of the software. Mm -hmm. and when you boot the system, it doesn't know that it needs to be updated. Oh, okay. Well, in the, in the secure boot, um, 
everything goes along fine until you have a problem. You could change it very easily to support automatic updates by having it at some point during that boot process just send out a discover message saying, hey, I'm booting, do I need anything? And, and at which point then the server would come back and say, yeah, you need X, Y, and Z and, and, and start the, the, re the build process that way. So. The, uh, the nature of the uh, vulnerability from having to uh, run the check code and RAM, mm -hmm. did that transfer over to like the Secure Act network environment where you're, you're actually claiming that the evaluation layer is mm -hmm. okay. Well, if I go, I'll go back to that slide. The, the, the difference in the, in the, the um, uh, actually I have to go through all the slides here. Oops. The, the difference is that this, this is, you know, once, once the evaluation environment is actually running, this stuff has already been, been fired off and has disappeared. Uh, and so my verification code, the fact that it had to sit in memory for like five seconds, you, know, you basically had like a five second window. Um, that window has disappeared by the time the evaluation environment's running. Because once I verify the operating system, the operating system takes over and you know, the age, age just disappears at that point. Uh, so uh, the packets coming in uh, are never going to see that see that window. Okay, so then I can, I can see where the firmware would be verified. Mm -hmm. um, how power the operating system, and possibly the operating system if it's loading from a known image. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have a signature. The same, the same would go for the evaluation environment right. because it's nothing more than software running it. Right. I, I didn't actually do the work to verify the evaluation environment. There are two students at Penn right now uh, for their senior project that are taking uh, Aegis and I verify, I get the operating system going, and they then have added code to the operating system to verify the start of the evaluation environment, right? And they, they then take it up to the packet level. Yes, Paul? The uh, operating system you were using was the uh, Pico GSD. Right. Um, so there wasn't a lot of the operating system that needed to be verified. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the advantage of, of using a BSD uh, operating system is it's monolithic. Uh, unlike NT, which has all these DLLs and everything else all over the place. Um, so, and, and the, the choice was made because of that reason. If this was applied to something like NT, where you have to check DLLs in mm -hmm. the industry, how long do you think it would take to verify all that? Um, well, I mean, it depends on how you, I guess you would do the verification. You know, one argument is that you could verify the disk partition. Uh, and then... Just the raw disk. Right, the raw disk. The, 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 pro, the, the time, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about verifying such a large area like that is, is that the cost of the public key operation is going to be, you know, amortized into the cost of the hash. I mean, the hash is what's gonna, going to be the largest cost of any verification. And when you have a lot of data, the cost of the hash just, just starts eating everything up. And that's what I found when I, when I added the code to the OS, to, to BSD, to, or SunOS, to to do the verification of programs was that, in average, the cost was pretty small. Well, until you fired up Emacs, you know, which is this very large program, then it took a long time for Emacs to come up because, well, you know, hey, uh, you're it's because of the cost of the hash. And I don't really see any way of getting around that. Uh, in the OS, what we did is we cached. I built a, a cache, um, you know, basically a, a write cache that was invalidated if the file was open for writing. Um, you know, that's what computer scientists do. You, know, you run into something that takes a long time, okay, amortize the cost, build a cache. Um, and, and that worked out fairly well uh, because uh, Osterhout and some others had done some studies that, that show that there's a great locality in the, in the types of programs that people touch uh, in Unix. And so if you combine that with a cache, uh, it, you, you get the fairly good speed. Um, we were talking though about dynamic integrity, mm -hmm. and Paul has brought up the question about NT. Right. And so you have this self-modifying operating system. Right. Now, how is that going to um, 
Yeah, the re I mean the registry. The registry in NT is, is probably the hardest, and I don't know enough about NT to, to, to know where it all modifies itself, but the registry is the obvious place. Um, you know, the registry, you know, from looking at all of the, the websites about NT has a, a great deal to do with the security of the system. And so how do you, how do you validate and continue to, to verify this, this, this image? And, you know, Unless you have some kind of controlled access to that, you know, some kind of trusted path that, that validates the changes and then up, you know, updates the signature, I'm not really certain what you can do at that point. Uh, I mean, if you allow, when you have something that affects security and you allow changes to it, uh, you know, more or less willy-nilly, uh, you have problems. Uh, so, uh, and so I don't know how you can get around that without making changes to the operating system itself. So. I have kind of a follow-on question. Mm -hmm. You may not be able to answer this, but thinking about this sort of active uh, network idea, um, even if you do this validation of uh, incoming packets and the validation of the node, mm -hmm. um, what kind of work is being done to ensure that the composition of the incoming stuff, what's already there, will in fact uh, adhere to the security properties? Uh, that's, that's a very good question and as far as I know, nothing right now. Uh, the work is primarily focused on uh, the packets coming in with a signature uh, and if the signature is valid and the packet is considered good and that the interaction between the packets uh, is not been looked at at all. Now, you know, one possible way to do that is to to spin off a virtual machine for each connection as it comes in. Um, and as far as I know, that hasn't been looked up. And that might be an interesting, interesting idea. Where would the AGIS sort of code reside in one of these active nodes? Um, well, the AGIS code is all in the, in the, in the firmware yeah. on the motherboard. Uh, so that would yeah, we're, we're fine. You know, the, well, if if you look at it in this in this as, in this respect, there's two aspects to it: the, the part that's in firmware and the part that's going to be in the OS. So the firmware takes you up to the OS. The OS then has modifications in it such that when you evaluate, you know, to verify the evaluation environment before it starts up. Is that code? Is that Aegis code verify itself as part of the process? Um, it is verified. Well, it's first of all, it's stored in an immutable device. Um, and so its integrity from the standpoint of security is assumed. I do do a hash over it to check for, you know, ROM failures, that kind of thing. But I mean, if you, obviously if you can invalidate the immutabi immutability assumption, then you can just, you know, rewrite the code to have it do anything you want it to do. So that's why I just did a hash to check for failure. And you store the expected value in the image? Yeah. 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 Check itself. Yeah, I mean, because you have a chicken and the egg problem at that point and, and there's, no matter what you do, there's a way to defeat it. So there's no sense in trying to be slick. Another question. Sure. What sort of um, software engineering or firmware engineering techniques did you do to ensure that the Aegis code was in fact um, trustworthy? Well, being that this was a PhD dissertation, <laughs> I'd like to say a lot, um, but uh, in practice, uh, you know, I looked over the code. Um, I had uh, somebody working with me who looked over the code, uh, and that's about it. I mean, it's basically code review. Inspection. Code inspection, yeah. Um, you know, we had some design documents and stuff like that, but certainly no formal design process um, because we were building something that we didn't really know how it was going to end up when we were doing it and so you you have false starts and you backtrack and stuff so like that. So you think that if this went into a more robust commercial product? Oh, it, it, it's definitely not ready for prime time, that's for sure. The, the first prototype. Um, we're, with, with the SDK that I was telling you about earlier, uh, we're looking at, at making something that will be ready for prime time uh, for the active network community. Um, and in that case, we'll hopefully do a little bit more, you know, uh, it, it depends. If we have students do it, um, then it probably won't be as rigorous as we'd like. Um, if we actually can, you know, get it into, uh, it, you know, if DARPA provides the funding so that you can give it to, 
uh, a corporate, you know, company to do, then that's a different story. And you can you can you can place on them the restrictions to do that type of solid engineering that's required. So, would you see that that engineering um, has been in any way different from the kinds of engineering that's been applied to uh, high insurance systems in the past? Um, maybe you're too young to right. remember. <laughs> Class A1, right, right, right. No, I, I, I think that um, un, un, unfortunately this is where uh, practicality kind of creeps. You know, the, the, the standard tension between practicality and security, unfortunately, uh, the, the cost of doing A1 level development is so prohibitive that, that we probably wouldn't be able to do it. Why not? Uh, there's not very much of this. Uh, yeah. It might wind up in a lot of places. Wouldn't it be worse? It, it's certainly something to consider, but you have to look at the sponsors and say, you know, it, it's, it, it wouldn't be my decision. The sponsor has to say, is this something that we want to, you know, is this something that we feel is important enough to fund? Uh, so. I wasn't thinking of the sponsors so yeah. much as, as when you've got commercial. Right. Yeah. The the, the commercialization, uh, honestly, um, the the potential for it isn't all that great, in my opinion. Uh, you know, really, you're looking at only two places that want this type of level of security, uh, you know, in the clients, and, and, and that's the, the defense community and, and the financial community, to some degree, the financial community. Um, you know, if it gets commercialized, the, the place where it's going to be commercialized is going to be in the switches and the routers, uh, that type, of, you know, kind of in the, in the infrastructure backbone, where you want to have uh, a little bit more control over things. People are really willing to be very loose on the on the endpoints of the network. Uh, they're they're fortunately recognizing they need to be a little tighter within the infrastructure itself. So not that the endpoints are not important. But. Thanks very much. Questions.